In this week's Parsha, we read about Yosef revealing himself to his brothers. Very dramatic, very emotional. But listen to the almost the first things that Yosef says to his brothers. Now, these are the brothers that sold him into slavery. <clears throat> so he says to them as follows. Um, I am Yosef, your brother, whom you sold into slavery. In case you think I've forgotten. I've forgotten. <clears throat> but then the next verse says, Now, however, do not be upset or angry with yourselves that you sold me here, for God sent me ahead of you to be a provider and a sustenance for you. So yes, you, you sold me. That's what you did. But God's plan was that I should become a provider and be able to sustain you during the time of, of hunger. Then in verse uh, 7, he says, God sent me ahead of you to prepare that there be a remainder of you in the land and to sustain you so that a great number of you survive. So it's literally a matter of survival. So you see, he says, it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he made me Pharaoh's counselor, master of his entire household and ruler of the whole land of Mitzrayim. And that's why you are now able to go quickly to my father and to say to him, this is what your son Yosef has said. God has made me the master of the whole of Mitzrayim. Come join me, do not delay. So we have here an interesting combination. The first thing he says is, I am your brother, you know, the guy you sold into slavery. He's not, he's not excusing them. What you did, you sold me into slavery. That was your intention, that was your thinking, that was your purpose. Maybe even for a good reason. But God had another plan. So, in truth, you did not send me to Egypt. God sent me to Egypt. So is that a bit of a contradiction? First he says, you sold me into slavery. Then he says, no, no, God. Both things are true. They did, in fact, sell him into slavery by their own free will. Had they known what God's plan was, had they acted in order to facilitate God's plan, then it would have been perfect. But they sold Yosef into slavery for reasons of their own, maybe even noble reasons, but their own reasons. So Yosef says, you, acting on your own, sold me into slavery. Does that mean I am here because of your choice? No. I am here because God sent me to Egypt. With a vast eternal plan. So, what you did, you take responsibility for. What happened to me... I'll take responsibility for that because that's between me and God. Which is exactly the way we're supposed to think. There are people who may have uh, negative intentions and would like to hurt you or acted on hurting you. That was their decision. That was their choice. And for this, they have to answer. But what actually happened to you, in fact, that's between you and God. 
So we are never the victim of another person's free choice, even though they have free choice. <clears throat> and they can act on their free choice. Doesn't mean you have to be affected. Unless God has a reason for you to uh, end up where they thought they were sending you, but in fact, God is sending them. That's one fascinating thing in the Sedra. And then there's another interesting thing. <clears throat> you know, people question, is there any evidence for the whole event of Jews being enslaved in Egypt and coming out with an exodus? Is there evidence? People insist that there's no evidence. But it's not true. In fact, there is evidence for every detail of the story, not just the enslavement and not just the exodus. For example, according to Egyptian record, it shows very clearly that before Yosef became the viceroy of Egypt, Egypt was divided into... Um, into territories, and each territory had its ruler. So Pharaoh was the king of one section of Egypt, but not all of Egypt. Now hear what it says concerning what happened. Yosef told Pharaoh, you got to prepare for the seven years of famine. Store up the grain. Tell everyone to store up their grain. And so people did. But <clears throat> they didn't know how to preserve the grain, to store it in such a way that it wouldn't spoil. So by the end of the first year, all their grain had already been used up. So here's what it says. Now there was no bread in the whole country for the famine was very severe. The inhabitants of the land of Mitzrayim and the land of Canaan, which eventually became Israel, were exhausted as a result of the famine. They had exhausted all their, all their storage, their, uh, their wheat. Yosef collected all the money to be found in the land of Mitzrayim and the land of Canaan as payment for the produce they were buying. And Yosef brought the money to Pharaoh's treasury. In other words, the people eventually came to Yosef who had stored food successfully that hadn't spoiled and they bought the food. And all that money went into Pharaoh's treasury. <clears throat> now, the money from the land of Mitzrayim and the land of Canaan was used up. They spent all their money. So all the Egyptians came to Yosef saying, give us bread. Why should we die in your presence? Because the money has run out. So now they had no wheat and they had no money. Yosef replied, Bring your livestock, and I shall give you bread in exchange for the livestock if your money has run out. They brought their livestock to Yosef, and Yosef gave them bread in exchange for horses, sheep, goats, herds of cattle and donkeys. And thus he guided them through that year by giving them bread in exchange for their livestock. So now Pharaoh owned all the money and all the livestock. That year ended, and in the second year, the Egyptians came to him and said to him, We are not withholding anything from you, for indeed the money and the animal livestock has been used up. Everything now belongs to my Lord. Nothing remains before my Lord except our bodies and our land. Why should we die before your eyes, both uh, we and our land? Buy us 
and our land for bread. And let us and our land become slaves to Pharaoh. Give us grain and seed so that we may live and not die and that the land not become desolate. So now all they had to offer in order to buy food was themselves and their property. Yosef acquired the entire land of Mitzrayim or Pari. For each of the Egyptians had sold him his field because the famine had overwhelmed them, and thus the entire land belonged to Pharaoh. In the Egyptian record, you actually find that in that year or two, all the uh, different districts were suddenly united and Pharaoh became the king over all of it, exactly as it's described here. So yes, there is evidence, even for such a detail. And yes, there is evidence that Pharaoh killed all the baby boys because the record shows that 15 years after that decree, the population in, in Egypt was many more women than there were men. And all the infant skeletons that they had found younger than three months, they now knew were boys. Because 15 years later, there were many girls, but few boys. There is evidence for every detail of the story, and it's just, I don't know, a bias? Where people keep saying there's no evidence when there is? So either they're uh, miscalculating the dates, or they just don't want to validate the story. Now, I can understand why Egypt wouldn't want to validate it. Why would they want to describe their own failure and their own wickedness? But why the academic world and even some Jews, some rabbis, actually insist that there is no evidence? It's a mystery. Because there is abundant evidence. How could there not be? These are major events we're describing here. How can there not be telltale evidence? So there is. So it's fascinating to see how, how the truth that we know, because we read it in the Torah, we can also know from the records from archaeology, history, Egyptology. It's all there. So now, <clears throat> Yaakov comes down to Egypt with great honor, invited by the Pharaoh himself, given the most fertile part of the land, the northern area, for the uh, flocks, for the sheep, because his sons were shepherds. And the best 17 years, the most tranquil 17 years of Yaakov's life were those last 17 years that he spent in Egypt. How could life in Egypt be the best years for somebody as holy as Yaakov? So we read in the Parsha. Yaakov sent Yehuda ahead of him so that by the time Yaakov arrived in Egypt, Yehuda had already sent, set up a yeshiva where Torah was being studied. And so Yaakov could feel at home spiritually, even in the land of Egypt, because the yeshiva was there before he even arrived. About that we will read next week's Parsha.
we have a Sunday night program for VIPs that you might be interested in. It's informal. It's questions and answers. It's conversation. It's really relaxed. It's really pleasant, enjoyable, informative, and uh, kind of community-like. It's a Sunday night program. There's a um, Wednesday morning program for the VIPs, and there's a Wednesday night program. All of it, just conversation, casual, laid back, unscripted. So join us. Take a look. Click uh, the link below and see which, which of the three suits you best and join us for some enjoyable conversation.